Hello and welcome to In the Envelope, an awards podcast. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, the most trusted name in casting. I'm here to spotlight some of the most exciting film, television, and theater awards contenders working today. Who is in the running? What makes an awards-worthy performance? And how can you, my dear listener, win a statue of your own? We're sitting down for intimate, inspirational interviews with actors and artists to get that insider's perspective on these questions and more. It's an opportunity for some of today's most talented stars to share their craft and career advice, and maybe, just maybe, provide a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. We want you to kick ass. Yes. It's not a big scary room. Like we are desperate for Mm -hmm. everybody to nail it or to bring something because there are so many people that that I've fallen in love with that I just sit there and I go, oh God, there's something so weird about this one lady. (laughs) I like it. Jamie, hi. Hello. Tell me, um, talk to me. What do you do here? You do a lot of different things. Yeah, well, I do my voiceover work here. Yes. I do my photography stuff here. How much is the voiceover work? Like, how many how many hours a week? Oh, it's all over the all yeah, over it the depends. Map. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, I do a lot of uh, fair amount each week, and we do. I do v- VO meetups here. So anyone mm-hmm. who's in the Philadelphia, New Jersey area, you can come here once a month, and we get. 10 or so people together and we all do voiceovers in the booth and everyone to kind of gives the, feedback the and yeah. you know we, okay. we sort of run through auditions and cool. different styles and okay. what have you that's okay. that's fun and a lot of this this yeah. is all the groundwork that you lay before launching your podcast which is the vo school yeah podcast. that's that's another thing that i do here um right i've got this podcast that i put out every week currently we're on a hiatus but um mm-hmm. th- it, we may be up and running by the every time week. this episode comes yeah. out. Um, but we cover a different subject in the voiceover industry every week. Mm-hmm. So it might be a specific genre. It might be promos or commercials or audiobooks or something. Or it could be a business or a marketing or a health subject. Sure, yeah. Uh, we've so covered pretty much, yeah, yeah, pretty much everything. And uh, That's actually what I love most mm. about it is that I didn't think there were so many different areas of the voiceover industry, which is relatively new and it's fertile ground. It's... Yeah, it's new in so far as a lot of people now have access to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, you know, need theoretically, a, a guide, you need a path. Yeah, I learned sort of over a very, very long period of time and stumbled <laughs> my way into yeah. it. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, yeah. I thought Which I knew. Way to do it. I thought I knew all I needed to do because I have an audio engineering background. I thought, oh, I know how to do that. So it's just speaking right. into a microphone. Well, and you have it's a, more than that. <laughs> and you have a British accent. And yeah, a that helps. Voice. You that have helps. a great voice. Thank you. Yeah. Um, as with any subject that you end up delving into, you realize you don't realize how little you know when you first start. So mm-hmm. there is an awful lot to get into there. Um, so there's there's a lot of material. You know. Sure, that might be a natural segue mm. into today's guest. Yeah, not just because she's an Emmy winning voiceover artist. Yeah, who's had years and years and years of work uh, on a microphone. Yeah, um, but she's also a great example of someone who maybe has dealt with her fair share of rejection. And, you know, one of the ways of dealing with that is to create your own roles and to produce your own projects and to find your collaborators who are going to get you in front of the camera in your own way or behind the camera in your own way, right. taking control of your own destiny. That's yes. one of my favorite pieces of advice that Absolutely. I hear from people. Pamela Adlon is joining us on the podcast today. It's very exciting. And I think people are going to mm. get a huge amount out of it because she comes from that world of having <clears throat> been like you say both sides of the camera and of course i should imagine that i don't want to speak for her but she will have had some insecurities as every actor does when they start their yes. career and i think a lot of misconceptions happen when you're starting out thinking that everyone's out to get you but you mm. you're very you know the people that you're auditioning for or casting mm. with yeah 
uh, don't want you to succeed or are waiting to pounce on your every mistake. Yeah. Whereas in reality, everyone wants you to succeed. Everyone really yes. wants you to get the gig oh, and are really completely. rooting for you. And she's come out on the other side of all of that, of, yeah. that, of the trial and error. You, yeah, the yeah. trial and error you mentioned earlier about your your career. Yeah. It's true of anyone. <laughs> you got to have lots of failure. You got to have lots of risks that don't pay off your mistakes. Um, I think it's all resulted for her in better things, which is her FX comedy, yeah. which is very much inspired by her own life. The thing that I think is so great about Pamela Adlon is that she's a, such a multi-hyphenate. She's the writer, director, producer, and I just think she's a riveting actor yeah. on screen. I think she's she doesn't need to do anything, and she's compelling. But the stuff she has on Better Things is, is so rich and so beautiful and so nuanced and so like it's one of the, it's kind of one of those shows where sometimes a scene is happening. I I definitely can't explain why mm. it's affecting me in a certain way. I don't know where you first saw her, but I first saw her mm. on Louis. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'd obviously heard her on King of the Hill, but I didn't realize I was exactly. hearing her. Exactly, yes, um, for playing a teenage boy. Right. Yeah. You don't make that mental connection. Completely. <laughs> yeah. Um, but when I first saw her on Louis, mm. she, so, she stood out. I immediately Googled her. You yeah. know, I was like, who is this yeah, person? Like, yeah. I, you know, and uh, I couldn't wait to see her in subsequent episodes i was like i hope she's in this episode hope well and it's 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 true in person she so yeah she's the charisma in person is is very true and this actually actually in terms of um what was not recorded in this interview i wish had been because yeah. pamela and i sat outside the studio someone else was wrapping up beforehand and this was first thing in the morning too so i actually wasn't caffeinated enough <laughs> i didn't really have my wits about me to d- to deal with her level of like truly genius like she her just the rapid fire like it's almost like an aggressive form of (laughs) wit like her wit is her aggressive wisdom is like so and she's very honest yeah and and very candid in this interview there's a lot of that but she's also extremely generous i think that's a huge part of her charisma Mm. it's a huge part of those moments you see her on camera is that she knows how to listen and she knows how to take from someone else and give back so much more. Right. She's one of those performers. Yeah. And it should also be said that this happened in LA. This was the very first interview I did in this round of episodes in LA. Mm. I think this happened back in January. Yeah. I hope there weren't any like references to things happening in current events. because This was actually <laughs> recorded a long time ago. Uh, lots happened since then. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's uh, still, it came out after um, season two of Better Things, which yeah. is an extraordinary season of television. We got into some really great stuff in this interview. Pamela Adlon. This podcast is brought to you by Backstage, the world's number one casting platform. Listen, a lot of the guests on In the Envelope, an awards podcast, used Backstage at the beginning of their careers. It's how they are now in the running for Emmy, for Oscar, for Tony, etc. If you are at the beginning of your career as an artist... Here's what you do. You go to backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code envelope at checkout for a free 30-day trial. That's right. Free 30-day trial if you go to backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code envelope. All you got to do then is make a profile, upload a headshot, and start applying to jobs to the thousands of casting notices that are uploaded every day, which you can filter online to match your specific talents, your specific needs, your specific looks. Get that dream started today. Check out that free 30-day trial, backstage.com slash subscribe, enter the code envelope. Let's do it. Pamela Adlon is an actor, producer, director, and screenwriter. And on her autobiographically inspired FX series, Better Things, she does all that and more. Last year, picking up the Emmy nomination for leading actress in a comedy. Known also for her work in Californication and Louie, Pamela is a six-time Emmy nominee and one-time winner for outstanding voiceover performance as Bobby Hill on the animated hit King of the Hill. Here it is, our interview with the brilliant and hilarious Pamela Adlon. Hi. Hi, welcome to LA. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the In the Envelope podcast. Thank We're you. We're excited to have you. We are excited to have you because you are a working actor who stars in and created a show about a working actor. So backstage listeners of this podcast are very much wanting to hear from you. I believe. That's cool. Um, you never used backstage, did you? Um, maybe I did. I don't, I don't 
I don't really... It wasn't really around for voiceover gigs. I want to ask about how you got into the voiceover It's so funny because I'm actually... We're in my old neighborhood. Oh, uh uh-huh. Where me and all of my friends lived. Like... We all the actors mm-hmm. were all around here. The actors and the directors and like the theater people and, mm-hmm. um, it, you know, I I got into voiceover when I lived a few streets over in cool. this area. Oh, awesome. um, I was on unemployment because I couldn't. I wasn't getting hired. I wasn't uh-huh. even getting you know auditions, and wow. I somehow. Um, was lucky enough to start... Uh, somebody heard my voice in something. Right. A man, uh, Paul Doherty at Cunningham, CESD, um, and he called me in to read some copy, and um, it was like... He was like my... I was like Lana Turner, and he schwabs to me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so I came in, and I read copy, and it was a, um, a campaign for 7-Eleven, and I played this boy named Kevin, young Kevin... <laughs> Um, and I did that uh, campaign for years. Oh, cool. And then I started doing a lot of radio. And I really wanted to get into animation. Right. And um, I remember doing um, an episode. I, I I somehow got an episode of Rugrats. Oh, uh-huh. And I was in the green room with uh, Kath Susie, E.G. Daly, Chris Summer, mm. and Chris Cavanaugh. Rest in peace. Yes. And... I looked at all of them, and there was like a phone in there. This is pre-cell phones, and I thought, "Oh my God, they do this!" Right? They this do your first, this. Yeah. I this. wanted to do it so cool, badly. Cool. So then I started, you know, booking more and more. Mm. Um, and then I couldn't get booked in radio. Like there was some oh. delineation. Like gotcha. You could. You're good for radio ads campaigns, mm. and you don't really work Do, like, in voice animation. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And then that Rugrats moment that was kind of like you noticed this is what I want to do. Yeah. And I went to Klasky Chupo and I was like, I want to hang out here. But there was no formal training. There was no like voiceover. It was very much learning on the job. That's right. Yeah. For for me. I feel that if if anyone's listening to this and and wants any kind of pro tips, the, the which is so valuable to me, anything that's practical, um, <clears throat> if you have confidence, mm, mm-hmm. it gets you. I know that's a boring old adage, oh, but no, yeah. it's true. So like literally, you could be like I could be in a booth with John DiMaggio, Billy West, yes, Jeff Bennett. Kevin Michael Richardson, um, and if you're not completely, you know, laying yourself bare and trying everything and not being self-conscious, you're going to do as well as everybody. Mm. And Mm. I feel that with uh, voiceover, I've always said this, it's not really, I mean, my voice is what got me in the door, right? but it's really about my ear. Ah, cool. You know, which is um, when you can hear something and you you have a fine-tuned sense. Mm. I think that voiceover artists have the best ear. Yeah, they're the best listeners. Yes. Yeah. When you were doing the cupping your cupping your ear thing. That's to right. Hear your own voice. Yes, that's the Gary of, Owens. Uh huh. You cup your ear. <laughs> I can't stand the sound of my own voice, and I'm a podcast host. I love your voice. Oh, gosh, Pamela Adlon. Mm. Um, what was the deal with you playing, I guess it's just because of the nature of your voice, you played a lot of boys. Yes. And you even, there's a story about an audition where you revealed yourself to be a girl, like, well into the audition or something. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> oh, please, that old saw. That was, <laughs> was me that in the 80s. As a kid, or? Yeah, you know, it's, it. I did... A ton of gender bendy yeah. kind of stuff. Very punk rock. Yeah, it was very. Um, you know, it was it was it was in the early eighties, hmm. and my hair was shorn off. Cool. Yeah. And I was so androgynous. It was the second time I had a short haircut. First time was when I was ten, hmm. and um, I was able to do like a a lot of stuff. So like I I was on Night Court. And mm. the character was that bull, Richard Mall, the big bailiff mm. in the show. He wanted to foster a kid. And um, 
I was pretending to be a boy the whole episode. Right. And then Selma Diamond, rest in peace, finds me in the bathroom, and um, and then at the end, there's a big reveal. Right. And I'm cool. wearing a dress, and John Larroquette says, "What a boy in a dress, big deal." <laughs> you know, so, and then I did, you know, Red Fox show. I did, um, uh, I did this, uh, pl- this musical called Backstreet, um, mm-hmm. and you know, uh, I did this movie called Bad Manners, and in the mm-hmm. credits they had to write "Girl Stevie." So oh, people would know. Yeah. And then um, on the Jeffersons, I robbed uh-huh. the dry cleaners. Ah. And, you know, nobody. And I was Tony. And so they had to, like, say, Whoa. girl, you know, I mean, who cares? <laughs> totally. Totally. And but it seems like voiceover, that's where gender swapping is happening. I, di- I never realized that I had transitioned from, transitioned from <laughs> being an on camera, you know, kind of gender morphed mm-hmm. person. Yeah. To doing all the animation, mm. my voice sits in a, a naturally like male pocket. Yeah, like in between. So yeah. you know, and then there's this thing that you know, if you if you cast like a real twelve year old boy or eleven year old mm. boy or thirteen year old boy, their voice is going to change. Definitely, yes. So, um, so it's smarter to invest in you. Yeah. For, for um, yeah. What you call it? Yeah, because my balls aren't dropping; they're just <laughs> remaining. <laughs> Yes. In my throat. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and King of the Hill, you've said it really changed the changed your career. Yeah, that was really launched your career. I guess that it was. You know, there's there's a few places that I can see are like the posts, the of, junctures. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, like it was. It's cool to see that looking back. Yeah, I look back and I'm like. Grease 2. Yeah, your first movie was Grease 2. You know, and it was such a <laughs> shameful thing <laughs> then. It still is, I think. But <laughs> it's like, I mean, people it's are like... It's a cult like, favorite. Yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's cult. Yeah. It's, it's cult. <laughs> but like, so you've got your Grease 2, and then you've got all your 80s television. Right. And then you've got... Um, a, bi- a big one for me was Bed of Roses. Hmm. I was cast as Mary Stuart Masterson's best friend in, mm-hmm. in that movie. And that was a kind of a big turning point for me. Cool. Yeah. And my father had just passed away. Mm. And um, I did Bed of Roses. And then another big turning point for me was like, um, I guess during that time, I, I booked King of the Hill. And then it's like, we had no idea. Oh, that it would run for? No. Yeah, forever. You know, that... W- and then, you know, the fact that you have a job and you're making real steady, money. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. And then you won an Emmy. I did. I won an Emmy. <laughs> you're never expecting that, right? No. <laughs> and I was pregnant with my third daughter oh, at the wow. time. And I remember one of the producers calling me and saying, um, y- you won an Emmy. And I was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Yay, yay. I can't believe it. Is everybody so excited? He was like, No. No, Pam, oh. you won an Emmy. You. Oh. You alone. <laughs> you thought you. it was the show. <laughs> and I, I, I didn't understand. And I said, but the Emmys didn't happen yet. Oh, because it was the... Um... It was the juried... It was the Creative Arts right. Emmys. Right. So... Um, That's right. But yeah, that was... It, it was incredible. And um, it, it, an incredible experience. I've, I've said this uh, quite a bit over the past year... Yeah. Um, that I learned so much about writing from those writers mm. and from... From the, acting on that show. Yeah. Cool. From th- those brilliant scripts, and uh, which were so nuanced and everything. There was just a lot of um, great, sweet comedy moments, huge comedy moments, mm. and then air. Like, the show breathed. Oh, cool. You know? And so uh, I... It was just it was a win, win, win. Because sometimes they say in comedy you don't want air; you want like fast paced, no pauses. Not in my comedy. But in better things, there's air. Yes. There's breathing. There's That's listening. I, like. I think. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. I was just watching the scene where your eldest daughter is dating a 35 year old man mm-hmm. and is confessing that she's way in over her head and she needs help to kind of get out of it. Yeah. And Sam, your character, is not moving is not saying anything yeah yeah and it's a yeah. whole scene where she's got the big long speech and she's confessing mm-hmm. and you're just breathing and you're listening and then you're breathing and then you're listening and then you're breathing and you're listening and it's like that's the scene 
I love it's that. a whole dialogue free scene from your character's perspective. Mm-hmm. And you're saying you learned that from playing a voiceover character in another sitcom. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, e- everything uh, leads you, you know, every, every single sure. thing is a stepping stone. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, in terms of, you know, my, my own life being a mom with my daughters, I would be accused of the opposite. You never listen. Uh-huh, right. You know, so so you're writing yourself onto the screen with. But I like to I like to watch people listen. Mm-hmm. I yeah. like to see people's faces mm-hmm. and hear somebody else talking and not necessarily see the person talking. Totally, that's interesting. To Reacting me. rather mm-hmm. than acting. Yeah, for sure. It's it's a beautiful show. Thank this is the you. part where I gush about the show. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> that season finale just like gives me chills every time I think about it. Um, why do you think there are so many comedies out there, comedy TV series, mm-hmm. based on a comedian's life or inspired by? You know, I feel like there's like a gradient and you're somewhere in between where you're not Jerry Seinfeld literally just playing himself. Yeah. Or you're not kind of super, super fictionalized. You're mm-hmm. playing Sam, which is not you. Mm-hmm. But you do have three daughters and you are a working actor. Yeah. So I feel like you're in the middle well you know i feel like you know this format i did a show called unscripted Mm -hmm. um and it was a show that i did with george clooney grant heslov steven soderbergh it was on hbo they did 10 episodes Mm. and it kind of cracked my head open because at that time nobody was doing uh what's happening now Mm. so it was the first time i worked with digital um, that uh, film wasn't rolling out. Like, we could do 20-minute takes. I was like, what the f*** is happening? Is oh, somebody cool. going to yell cut? That's a w- weird transition. And yeah. it was a, a complete improvisation, the oh. show. Oh. And then they would give us a framework. Oh, wow. And so um, uh, it, it was kind of just an amazing thing to me because my friend Grant was like, Pammy, you're going to do the show. And I was like, okay, what do I play? He goes... You're playing yourself, and then you uh, have an affair with this guy Nick. I'm like, but I'm married and I have kids. He goes, I know that, but nobody knows that. Right. And I right. was like, I don't get it, but okay. <laughs> right. But I'm playing myself. Right. So partially imaginary circumstances, but not. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like you know, you you look back at the Larry Sanders show mm-hmm. when my friend David Duchovny, mm-hmm. who. Uh, Larry, uh, Gary Shandling, rest in peace. There's the third one. The third one. Toy, toy, toy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when David was making fun of himself, and they mm. were talking about how David might be gay, like queer uh, for Larry. Do you remember that? No, no, I never saw that. So, so this is this is an amazing thing. <laughs> that because was almost a turning point. If of... you go back to the origin mm. of playing with reality, right, and almost meta. Yeah, you yeah. can say anything. Okay, I'm Pamela, and I'm I'm playing myself on this show, mm. but I have all these other things that aren't true to my life. Right. Who says that you have to stay totally exactly within your? You know what I mean? Yeah, you almost have more freedom because you have like a jumping off point. I feel that it's very interesting for people to be telling their own stories. Mm. Yeah. In this way. Mm. So, you know, if you have something that's interesting about your life, you may not think it's interesting. Right. But other people do. Mm. So it's like when I first was coming up with the pitch for my show, I was like, okay, what am I? Am I a manicurist? Mm. Yeah. D- did I was I married? Did my husband disappear? Right. Like uh like Olivia Newton John's husband on an island or whatever. You know what I mean? Like I was coming up with all of these things. Okay, I have one son adopted from Africa, one Chinese oh. daughter, and that's it. Uh-huh. Um my gay brother lives in the guest house in the back. Okay. Like I mean, you know, all of this Totally. And then it's just like just do your life. Yeah. Yeah. Do the bones of your life. Cool. And then go from there. Yeah. Yeah. But now people are like, oh, did that really happen? Right. Yeah. And you're like, no, 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 no. But like you said, like you were joking earlier about like using material from your everyday life. And obviously you're writing that into the show. Obviously you're inspired by. Oh, God. Yes. Yeah. But it's never like you're transcribing exactly what's happening in in the world. And then you're writing it into the script. Sometimes I am. Oh, really? Oh, like when? 
Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's too personal. I had a question. medical <laughs> moment last okay. week that's going in season three. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the whole okay, thing. Okay, cool. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. So that's one of those moments where you're like having an out of body experience where you're like, this belongs in a TV show. My TV show. Well, it's like when you come to. You're oh. like, oh, God, <laughs> fuck, I have to write that. Yeah, That's and you have funny. to write it down. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, I've had, I, that, I've had those moments, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, and also, in terms of, you know, you bringing up to me being an actor mm-hmm. and, and doing my show now, you know, through the years, I've worked with uh, directors who are actors, and yes. I've always had super positive experiences. Cool, cool. Yeah. I think they make great directors. Yeah, I agree. You know? Well, and it's always, a, I've asked this of actor directors before, but how on earth do you do it? How do you, is it a question of switching hats between the director and actor? You're in most every scene of the show. I could describe it this way. Mm-hmm. My, um, my script supervisor will come up to me and say, I need to speak to the actor, Pamela, oh, now. Okay. And then she'll point hmm. at the, the page at, like, all of the lines that I forgot. Oh. And she would go, did you want to <laughs> say that? And I would be like, okay, thank you, Babette. But they're also words that you wrote? Yeah. <laughs> With my partner. So many so, hats. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. And or my first AD will come up to me, Sally Sue, and say, I need to speak to the director, Pamela. Now. Gotcha. Yeah. So when they do that, it helps me. Totally. Um, I like to keep my set very tight. Um, mm-hmm. It's not, a, you know, a big social, you know what I mean? Um, I keep my days short. Oh, okay. um, I I don't like to overextend. I feed my crew four times a day. Mm-hmm. It's a very happy workplace. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that if I'm in a scene, here's mm-hmm. a good example. We go to this, to the, to the set of the next scene. We'll shoot four scenes a day, maybe 10 pages a day. Gotcha. Pieces of four episodes um, hmm. I'll, I'm standing in maybe Frankie's room and all of a sudden the crew is in there and, uh, there's one of my actors and then my first AD and, uh, and then they're pushing me. Here, here comes my DP and, and they're going, <clears throat> okay, if we get this by lunch or whatever, mm-hmm. and I'm sitting there and I'll just excuse myself, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. walk around the corner, take a beat. Because I have to protect the integrity mm. of the show, of the scene, for the actors, for myself. Mm. I know when to stop mm-hmm. and when to keep moving. If mm. you don't stop yeah. and concentrate, you're never going to get anything done. Hmm. You know, I mean, I have to, you know, wearing all the hats is one thing. So, one sacrifice I make is that I can't hang out and kibitz with, you know, a room right. full of my actors. But understand, like in graduation, when I have all my actors, mm. um, I do need to carve some time and sit with them, right? And allow everybody to ask me every question that they have, mm. you know, and be there for them in that way, mm. <clears throat> and be there for the kids. Right. Well, and yeah. Let the kid Cause the actors kids know. Too. Yeah. yeah, and let them know. I'm not gonna. We're not gonna stop until we get it. Right. And I want you to trust me. Because mm. mm. that's that's what you mean about the integrity of the show. It's yeah. about building the trust between your you the actor and your co-stars, between you the director and your crew. That's right. And sometimes you got to find the right moment to get into that mindset. That's right. And so and take the time to do that. If I know. When things get too buzzy crazy, I'll just mm. go around a corner, take a breath, nice. think about the scene, think about what happens in that episode. Mm. Oh, yeah. And then go back in. It only takes a minute. Is it like you're becoming Sam? Is that sort of Sam is there. what it's like? Oh, okay. So that's not an effort. Gotcha. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. like if I'm doing a... a king of the hill session like bobby is always there mm-hmm. he's always there <laughs> yeah. i don't have to think about it right so i don't have to think about sam cool i think about everybody else so i shoot a scene gotcha 
and I don't, you know what I mean? It's like, I, I get, I keep things to a minimum. So my production designer, my director of photography, mm. um, my first AD, everybody goes to them for the little uh, dribs and drabs. The details, yeah. Don't, don't fill me up too much. But the buck stops with me, right. which is why I think the model of my show works mm. because it's efficient yeah and um it's uh, very satisfying everybody gets their day in the sun mm. and it's a family your your yeah. crew and your cast it's all about. absolutely that's crucial i think yeah especially for a show about family absolutely yeah i mean yeah shabbos every friday <laughs> yeah break out the manischewitz <laughs> that's great <laughs> um the we also uh, backstage obviously we're fascinated by casting and we're it's always interesting to ask about casting like how much of the magic of your show would you attribute i'm thinking especially about the three kids Mm -hmm. is that you know you have to find kids who (laughs) like you said there's puberty is a factor sometimes for kids Mm -hmm. and you want to find the kid who's gonna be a solid young kid and then maybe if it runs for forever yeah and you want a kid who's going to be solid throughout puberty and who's going <laughs> to... I keep spitting. Well, you know, for <clears throat> for me, casting, I've always been like an armchair caster. So uh, Felicia Fazzano, who's one of my closest friends, she's my casting director. Mm-hmm. I've worked with her for seven seasons uh, in Californication. Oh, cool. So we used to like text and talk at night and say, who are you going to get for the girl who's... Gotcha. And it, it just... It's something that I really love to do. Mm -hmm. So now, um, you know, I love actors. So any anything that an actor brings is just a gift. Right. So, Mm. you know, uh, Henry Thomas. Yeah. Like as Robin, he auditioned. (laughs) Oh wow. (laughs) You know, and you're like, you know, Felicia knows. Like, I don't want to be tipped. I just want her to present me with who gotcha. she has. Mm. Don't tell me w- about his past and who he was in what movie. I just want to see like an untarnished, cool. you know what I mean? Hmm. And so um, uh, y- when she was casting the, the and and Henry Thomas speaking about him, he was the most un-Hollywood, oh. um, kind of just this magical you know we got him mm. for this these three or four episodes and it was just the sweetest quietest performance that was just like mm. and everybody was in love with him yeah and it was just like where did you come from <laughs> right and it was it was an amazing <laughs> thing and so and of course one day we're shooting in the vineyard and i call him elliot and he <laughs> And he said, okay, Dolores, which is <laughs> oh. my character from Greece, too. So uh, we always say Elliot and Dolores right again. <laughs> but, I thought that was a meta casting. I thought it was like we're casting a former child actor who's best known for his child role. I, n- I only realized that. You picked him because he was the best. Uh-huh. He, was, he was the best. Yeah. We all adored him. He's extraordinary. Yeah. And then in terms of. Uh, you know all the roles my daughters right the people you know i i meet actors and i stole them away like in a rolodex in my head right well do you watch a lot of tv too um or is it more about the meeting actors uh well i have watched a lot of tv through the years i love television i love film Mm -hmm. but you know it's like i i've known diedrich for years Mm -hmm. and um, you know, we do voiceover together. He handed me Miami. Oh, oh, cool. You know, and huh. I, I always thought he was great and funny and admired him as an actor. And being able to know that mm. I could get a, a subtle, rich, nuanced performance from him mm-hmm. when he lives in a big, broad comedy world. Ah. And I, I just pride myself on what he's been able to do Mm. in my show and to see these these wonderful uh moments happening and you know it's just it's been an incredible thing like i like to cast uh people inclusively and when you say that you don't say 
I'm casting a little person. I'm casting a trans person. I'm casting a gay person. I'm mm. casting a Chinese person. You just throw the net wide. Yeah. And gotcha. I guess the best way I could describe it is like I say, just don't go for white people. Just please yeah. no white people. You know what I mean? Like, totally. let's open it up. Yeah. I had um, two uh, actresses I worked with this season. One's name is Hollis and one's name is Allie. Allie ended up in the show. Hollis was in a scene that I had to cut. Mm. I had to kill my darlings. What happens? Brilliant. Mm-hmm. Uh, they could not begin to thank me enough for casting them. They were they were little people, and there's no mention of it in the script, and it's not scripted that way. Gotcha, yeah. But it's just about, yeah. why wouldn't you do that? Right, right. That's the way the world is. Yeah, it's a, that, I love that, that. It's not about diversity, it should be about inclusivity. And that's yes. what you just said the, is the definition of it. You cast a wide net. That's right. And, and like you said, too... Actors provide you gifts oh. of like inspiration. Mm -hmm. Like you must get inspired by actors who you don't end up casting, like in their auditions. Oh, maybe. oh, one hundred percent. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the in terms of auditions, it is you are doing yourself the greatest service mm. by reading for a part. When we would get, uh, <laughs> you know, scripts and all of this stuff. Um, uh, when Louie and I were working on the show on season two, mm -hmm. if it says offer only next to the name, uh -huh. we're kind of not into it. Oh, interesting. Um, why wouldn't you as an actor want to... To present your own... Yeah. Yeah, what you have to give. And, and um, you know, it's funny because I talked about Hollis. Hollis came in to read for another part. Oh, And cool. I fell in love with her. Gotcha. I love when that happens too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Every single day, every single session we would have, I would say to Flea, stick a pin in that person. I've got to find something for mm. that person. Mm -hmm. Anytime you get yourself in a room, any room, you're doing yourself a great service. You're doing yourself a great service and you're doing the producer, creator yes. of the show a service too. Yes, you're and the thing is, and people say that this is a cliche, but it's not. They, We want you. To kick ass. Yes. We are not, it's not a big scary room. Like, we are desperate for mm -hmm. everybody to nail it or to bring something. Totally. Because there are so many people that, I, that I've that i fallen in love with that I just sit there and I go, oh God, I've got, there's something so weird about this one <laughs> lady. I like it. I don't know what it is. And then, you know, I end up putting her, what happens a lot of the time is I'll say to Felicia, do you think this guy will do this tiny little part? Mm -hmm. I'll ask. Mm. I'll ask. And it, nine times out of ten, people want to do, people right. want to work. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's excellent audition advice to go into the room and just be you. Yeah. And maybe you're the solution to the casting director's problem or to the producer's like problem of we need to find an actor for this role. So you're just supposed to come into the room with like that energy of like, I'm here. I have, this is what I have to give. Absolutely. Maybe it doesn't work for this role. Maybe you'll remember me for the next role you're writing. Because the casting person is already in pre-production for the next project. Right, right. I mean, mm. everybody cherry picks from everybody's sessions. Sure. So you, oh, you cool. stay alive. You stay alive. And it's mm -hmm. just like, just go in there and just be, just present. Mm. It's, I mean, it's, it's just a win-win. Yeah. Every room you can get your face in, do it. Totally. When was your last audition? You don't really do this anymore. I audition for animation all the time. Oh, okay. Still, I put my voice down on, on my phone and I send my auditions in. Um, wow. Yeah, I don't... I mean, I'm I'm pretty busy, so... What should an actor who's new to voiceover know about a voiceover audition, especially versus a more typical audition? Um, d d just don't marry yourself to the idea of what you're going to... Uh, do mm. because they will change it in a heartbeat the second mm. you get into a room if you're auditioning in a studio or um, if you're sending in an audition like uh, by phone or mm -hmm. 
an MP3 or whatever, or you have your own home studio, or you're at somebody else's, give two takes. Give two different takes. Oh, cool. You know, and uh, let them, you know, you know, pitch your voice up, or put some, take the gravel out, mm. or Th- those are the kind of notes they give of like, sure, try it more like this. Or... And when and when you're doing voiceover, if if it's animation, mm. you got to keep the pace going. Mm, okay. And keep the color in your voice, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and and it, you know, my thing is natural, 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 natural. Mm. But um, I have a tendency to to speak really slowly, and I, you know, mm. you got to keep the pace going, right? Because you're thinking about having your eyes shut. Shut your eyes. Listen to yourself. These are great tips. Oh my gosh. Cool. And I don't know anything about voice. I've never done voiceover <laughs> acting or anything. Um, what other advice do you have for those just starting out? Take classes. Mm. Take a class mm-hmm. if you, if it, in terms of voiceover, sign yourself up for a class that leaves you with a demo at the end. Mhm. All of those classes are fantastic. Okay, cool. There's a you can sign up for an ad class like a doing, you know, radio right. or animation. You know, vet the people. Mm. Um, you know, if if you're going to invest your money in a class, um, you know, do the research. Mm. Go on Yelp. Mm. Um, you know, there and and uh, a really good uh, idea is to try to find a working animation director or actor who's teaching. So I think gotcha. like my friend D. Bradley Baker has uh, a website um, and he gives pro tips and hmm. uh, Andrea Romano teaches classes, Ginny McSwain, Charlie Adler. Um, <clears throat> They're working artists. These are working professionals. Yeah directors actors they're keeping abreast of the latest trends right. and technologies and all yeah. Of that yeah it's a it's the kind of world that i think a lot of actors are under the impression that it's a almost a quick fix like oh i can just record an audiobook oh and just become a voiceover star i I'm, I'm wondering if there are any other like preconceptions or clichés about the voiceover industry that well should it's be corrected. you know it's it's the greatest job if you can get it mm-hmm. um but it's difficult sometimes if you're doing like a toy or a game it's a repetitive oh, wow. and you're you're, <laughs> you're gonna be in there for four hours yeah. solid wow you know toys and games are uh take it out of you and huh. don't start a voice that you can't sustain for four hours that's Ooh. gonna tickle your throat or do something weird that's excellent advice you have yeah. to take care of your voice too yeah yeah you know, hot water, lemon, honey. Mm-hmm. All the all the yeah. remedies. The grandma. They work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Going back to better things. What do you learn about yourself as an actor with each passing episode or each passing season? Do you feel like you are growing as an actor? Um, I I do. Uh, I hope so. I hope so. I I. It must be such a unique learning opportunity to read your own words and to act it is. for your it's, own directing. It's, I separate myself. So when I'm watching playback, uh, it's not me. Okay. Otherwise, I'd be like, wow, does my neck have to look that old? Really? Yeah. You know, like yeah, you can't, you got to get rid of the vanity. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm choosing my frames with Paul Kessner, my DP. Mm-hmm. And I, I love, I, I never want to miss an opportunity. Every frame is an opportunity. But then I'm sitting there and I'm adjusting lights and I'm like, get that in the background. And then it's about cluing in. So if I'm working with Celia Imrie, mm-hmm. who's like a dame and shit, yeah. you know, she's amazing. She's amazing. Um, She'll she'll want my attention, but she doesn't want to take too much. Everybody's very mm. respectful of um, how limited, you know, uh, each uh, pl- uh, my time is in each area. Right. But I give it one hundred percent. So, mm. um, I'm so grateful when I get to work with actors mm-hmm. because they they just bring you. You just 
get elevated. Right. You know, I have Rade Serbervervevija. <laughs> I can't. Pro- I, he knows I can't pronounce his name. Who played <laughs> Arnold Hall at the Orpheum, and it's like, it's just so delicious mm. because I'm sitting there working with this world class actor, mm. and. It elevates you. I'm in the Orpheum, which was, you know, <laughs> I, I had such a boner for this. I wanted to shoot there so badly. Cool. So all my dreams were coming true. Right, it's overwhelming, yeah. And I'm sitting in this gorgeous theater where I saw Yoko Ono in 2010 with my daughters and cool. Plastic Ono Band. And I'm working with Rade, and you just, you fall into it. Mm. It's just this warm pool, you know? Well, then it, it's good that it's a warm pool because it also feels like what you're describing is super high stakes. Like, the stakes of being in a dream role, in a dream place with your dream co-star yeah. forces you to get in the zone. But you're saying it's not a scary It's a constant thing. zone. Ah, uh, mm-hmm. You're just, you know what I mean? Zone. It's a 39-day... Look, I'm hungry. Did you guys hear my stomach? <laughs> it's, a, it's it, you know, it's basically like I I have my prep and pre-production, and then you start principal photography, and halfway through, I'm like, don't start counting the days. Don't just don't think about gotcha. it. Yeah, you know, you just want everything to just be able to go smoothly mm-hmm. and flow and tu toy and <laughs> but um. You're just in the game the mm-hmm. whole time. Yeah. You're in the game. You know, I'm I'm sitting in Canada shooting the White Rock episode, which is how we finished shooting season two. Mm-hmm. And I woke up at 2.30 in the morning and I'm like, oh, God damn it, we missed a shot. Oh. We're missing a <laughs> shot from the graduation episode. Oh. And I talked to... My producer, um, Joanne Toll and Sally Sue Lander, my first AD, and uh, the next morning, and I'm like, I have to seat Max on the bench. Oh, I have to for put the her, last scene. Yeah, I have yeah. to put. We don't have that because there were there was like hundreds of crew, and we had a techno crane uh-huh. to shoot the dance sequence. Cool, cool. So, um, <laughs> uh, they had the bench flown in to Canada. Oh. The bench that we <laughs> shot in, uh, where we shoot here in Altadena, California. Oh, gotcha. They flew the bench in. Wow. They got like flowers that, to like, look like the bench. flowers and yeah. Max's clothes. Uh-huh. And they put me in the, the clothes that I wore. So when I'm sitting right. her down, we're outside the museum where the First Nations man say, You stole this from our <laughs> grandmothers. <laughs> okay. Wow. It's yeah. a trick. Because yeah. you just remembered that you'd forgotten that that shot yeah (laughs) crazy so the skill that you're learning as an artist is your that zone of like being in that work zone do you get better and better at that you do yeah like is season three going to be even more like streamlined and you know what you're doing and you're willing to take risks you can hope so yeah you know what i mean yeah god willing but (laughs) you know um you you it, the learning curve is so exponentially like fast, you know, has been mm. for me from shooting the pilot yeah. to season one to season two. Uh, it's been an amazing um, experience. So, and it's that that thing you said earlier about the junctures and looking back on your life mm-hmm. and like you can't ever you can't ever predict where your career is going to go or where your life is going to go. And it's only in retrospect that you see it's turning, turning points. points. Yeah. And Lucky Charms! We did it. We said Turning Point. Now I want to watch Turning Point. <laughs> I'm totally watching Turning Point tonight. Can I come? Yes! Shirley <laughs> MacLaine and Anne Bancroft. I've never seen it. <gasps> oh my god. Well, you're making me feel like there's all kinds of... You're mentioning all these 80s TV shows that I certainly have not watched. Oh, I'm that's do okay. My, I'm do you my homework. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no? Okay. No. no, but yeah, the... Um, I love the idea of, like, especially looking at... I think it's especially with actors. Like, you look at an actor's career and you can point to their IMDb page and be like, yeah. oh, that was when they must have met this person and that was a That's fun. big break for them, quote-unquote. That's like six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Yeah. From, yeah. Yeah. That That's true. But when you're in the thick of it, you can't you see that happening. Well, you know, you also... You remember the people that you like working with. 
cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and it's like if if somebody's pleasant and professional um, <laughs> in terms of voiceover, if you're efficient, fast, gotcha. good, pleasant, they'll keep bringing you back. Yeah. You know? You can't underestimate being nice. No, you can't. In this industry. You can't at all. Because that, like you said, those are the connections that help that help you, quote unquote, down the line. Yeah. Is when someone's like, I remember that person and they just left a positive impression on you. Yes, them. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And if you're in someone like in your position where you're casting actors, <laughs> it's in their interest to when they meet you or when they interact right. with you to be positive. In if, some they're, way. if they're being a little butt, nobody you're wants not to gonna work be, with them. No. Yeah, they're not going to be in your show. Yeah. Yeah. But I remember when I was just a, a little actor. <laughs> yeah. And I remember the people who were butts. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. And you're, yeah, you don't want to name names. Yeah. <laughs> it's better to name names. I love that how you talk about your collaborators with such reverence. It's really special. Thank you. It's, I love them. Right. You genuinely love them. Yeah. yeah. And I think that comes through in your work. Um, and also in terms of like writing your own roles there's that thing too of Mm -hmm. like in this show you were given the opportunity to do it and you were taking from your own life but often an actor will start writing just for the purpose of creating their own work yeah that's advice too right like that's well i just knew that i was i was ready to run a show Uh uh-huh i kind of knew when i like i was doing doing this like big network expensive waste of everybody's time and money show oh. and um i finally was like i'm ready mm. I, I i know how to do this cool so it, it's it's great for me because i'm i'm a natural mom i'm a mother yeah so oh, it's cool. like you know you can multitask you can read yeah yeah Keep them busy. You can be single-minded or big picture, depending on what's needed. It's like Pop Warner football, run or have a crew and run a TV show. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Kids need to have activities. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having this me. So awesome. Good job, Jack. <laughs> Thank you. In the Envelope, an awards podcast, is recorded at Lotus Productions, Hyperbolic Audio, and Big Yellow Duck in New York City, and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Like, rate, subscribe, tell your friends, and follow us on Twitter at In the Envelope. Thanks, as always, to producer, editor, and all-around podcast extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and thank you to the team at Backstage, the most trusted name in casting. That's Peter Rappaport, Rowan al Khatib, Francis Ramos, Caitlin Watkins, Lauren Rout, Mark Stinson, and especially Casey Howe. For more awards and industry coverage, head over to Backstage.com. Thank you for listening. Tune in next time for another glimpse in the envelope. <laughs>